Clinton revealed Morris's new approach to a shocked White House. All traditional policies were to be dropped. Instead, he would concentrate exclusively on policies that targeted the worries of the swing voters. V-chips would be fitted into televisions to prevent children from watching pornography. And mobile phones would be fitted into school buses to make parents feel more secure. Dick Morris also persuaded the president to spend his leisure time in the same way as particular groups of swing voters. He sent Clinton on a hunting holiday, dressed in exactly the Gore-Tex outfits a group called Big Sky Families liked. The aim was to reflect swing voters' lifestyles back to them. The Liberals in Clinton's cabinet hated this approach. And I would say, well, Dick, why have a campaign? This was the 1996 campaign. If all the president is going to do is offer up these little bite-sized miniature initiatives that appeal to people's uh, desires, uh, like consumers buying soap, uh, a V-chips that you could put in your tele televisions so you could make sure that your children did not have pornography and, and school uniforms. Uh, why talk about them? They're, they're, they're so mundane and they're so tiny. And he would say back, if we don't do this, we may not get re-elected. Uh, and I would say, what's the point of getting, getting re-elected if you have no mandate to do anything when you're re-elected? And he'd say, what's the point of having a mandate if you can't get re-elected? Isn't the ultimate goal getting re-elected? <laughs> but Morris's new politics were an extraordinary success. Clinton's ratings among the swing voters began to soar. And Dick Morris, along with the marketeer Mark Penn, took effective charge of making White House policy. Mark Penn set up a huge call centre in an office block in Denver. And every night, hundreds of telephone operators called swing voters in suburbs across the country to check with them every detail of policies that Clinton was proposing. The policy was made by a group of people manning telephones in Denver, Colorado, placing calls to voters in places like Westchester and uh, Pasadena and asking them what they wanted from their government um, and asking them very specifically about specific policies that Bill Clinton was considering. Would you be more likely to support him if he offered this particular government service or if he offered that one? Those people told them what they thought. Mark Penn transmitted that to Bill Clinton and it came out of his mouth. So essentially it was suburbanite voters. Suburban voters in the 90s were creating American domestic policy and some of its foreign policy as well. Really? Yeah, Mark Penn was polling on questions like whether we should bomb in Bosnia, things like that. Morris also insisted that Clinton make a symbolic sacrifice of the old politics to convince the swing voters to trust him. In August 1996, Clinton signed a bill which ended the system of guaranteed help for the poor and unemployed. Welfare would be cut back after two years in order to force people into work. The new system was called welfare to work and would, he said, be a hand up, not a hand out. It was the effective end of the guaranteed welfare system created by President Roosevelt 60 years before. For many in Clinton's cabinet, it was also the end of the progressive political ideal that Roosevelt had represented. The belief that one used a position of leadership to persuade the voters to think and behave as social beings, not as self-interested individuals. Dick Morris and the pollsters had won. And by that I mean that the people who ultimately got to the president, shaped the president's mind, were those who viewed the voters as just a collection of individual desires that had to be catered to and pandered to. It suggests that democracy is nothing more and should be nothing more than pandering to these unthought about, very primitive desires. Primitive in the sense that they are not even necessarily conscious of just what people want in terms of satisfying themselves. And the same triumph of the politics of the self was about to happen in Britain, too. In 1994, Tony Blair had become the leader of the Labour Party, and the reforming group centred around Peter Mandelson became all-powerful. Almost every night, Philip Gould ran focus groups with swing voters in the suburbs. But this time, he was listened to, 
of the desires and the fears of the new aspirational classes became the central force shaping Labour Party policies. In that period, I was talking to people who used to vote Conservative and were considering voting Labour, and they wanted understood that they are financially pressed and that there are limits to uh, the extent to which taxation can be improved. They, they think that crime is an issue that matters to them and should be uh, respected. They, you know, they want welfare to go to people who deserve welfare, not to people um, who do not. This was seen of by many in the Labour Party as selfish. I never saw that it was selfish. I believe that uh, you know, a, a dad or a mum doing their best for their family isn't selfish. They're just doing their best for their family, and that's what people do. A crackdown on those who make life hell in their local neighbourhoods through noise or disturbance. Law and order is a Labour issue today. The philosophy of campaigning is let's concentrate on swing voters, let's focus group them to find out what they want and what will appeal to them, and let's just relentlessly push those themes in the election. Something is happening to you. After promising to put money in your pocket, the Conservatives are quietly taking it away. Philip Gould was, was crucial because he gave the raw material, if you like, for these politicians to do uh, this kind of politics. In that when he came up with stuff, they'd follow it, you know, pretty much without exception. Blur himself would pour over these sort of 12-page memos and say, well, this is what we must do. We want people to earn more, to consume the good things of life. We want people to pay lower taxes. Gordon Brown says a Labour government would hold the main tax rates unchanged. A Labour government will not increase the basic rate of tax. I want to make it clear that I will not increase tax. In fact, the Labour Party does stand for Middle England. Those that aspire to do better, to get on in life, and be ambitious for themselves and their families, will do better with Labour. Groups of eight people drinking wine and nibbling, you know, Cheerios, um, what they thought determined effectively everything that the Labour Party did. And although those running the campaign liked to portray the new approach as their invention, it was in fact copied from the Americans. Even down to the phrases that the American marketeers had tested on their swing voters. Peter Mandelson and his team were in the United States watching what we did and copied almost verbatim our approach in their 1997 campaign. The benefit system should be about giving people a hand up, not just a hand out. Mendelssohn's not a fool if he's anything. He saw something that works and why not do it? And I can remember reading their manifesto and saying to myself, they just took it lock, stock and barrel. You know, on one hand you're proud and on another hand you're just a bitch. And as in America, Labour was forced to drop policies that would not directly benefit the swing voters, even if it meant sacrificing its fundamental principles. The commitment to public control of industry which was enshrined as Clause 4 of the party constitution, was dropped. The aim of Clause 4 had been to use the collective power of the people to challenge the unfettered greed of business. But now, Tony Blair was faced with crucial voters who no longer saw themselves as exploited by the free market. They saw themselves as individual consumers who were fulfilled and given identity by what business delivered them. The new Clause 4 promise not to control the free market, but to let it flourish. Business is more powerful than government. It is quicker, it is more creative. Business is the lifeblood of the country. From this come all the benefits that society needs. Employment, investment. I think, frankly, there is only one party getting business right, and that's New Labour. What New Labour did it suits people who exert power in society not through the political system or, or not through the democratic political system. So it suits big business and it suits entrenched interests and it suits the status quo. Um, you know, those three things, of course, just off the top of my head, being the things that the Labour Party is supposed to be, you know, a counterforce to. What that means is big business get to carry on exerting their power behind the scenes, getting their way, because there's no countervailing pressure. Countervailing pressure isn't going to come from, you know, eight people sipping wine in Kettering. 
Here he goes, turning an awful lot of other blue seats red as well. Very happy, very relieved, and very exhilarated. But those who masterminded Labour's victory in 1997 saw it as a triumphant vindication of a new form of democracy. By understanding and fulfilling people's inner desires through the focus group, they were giving power to individuals, not treating them as faceless groups who were told by politicians what was good for them. I don't believe, I don't see the focus group as some marketing tool. I see the focus group as a way of hearing what the people have to say. And I see the focus group as a way to a new form of politics. What the people give, the people can take away. We are the servants, they are the masters now. 1997 is, I think, fundamentally important in that. Because I think it is the end, the end of the uh, elitist politics that's dominated Britain for so much of the last uh, 100 years. In 1939, Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, created a vision of a future world in which the consumer was king. It was at the World's Fair in New York, and Bernays called it Democracy. It was one of the earliest and most dramatic portrayals of a consumerist democracy, a society in which the needs and desires of individuals were read and fulfilled by business and the free market. The World's Fair created a spectacle in which all of these concerns were met, and they were met by Westinghouse and General Motors and the American Cash Register Company, and company after company presented itself as this sort of centerpiece of a society in which human desire and human want and human anxiety would all be responded to and would be all be met purely through the free enterprise system. There was this sort of notion that the free market was something that was not guided by ideologies or by political power. It was something that simply was guided by the people's will. This was the model of democracy that both New Labour and the American Democrats had bought into in order to regain power. They had used techniques developed by business to read the desires of consumers, and they had accepted Bernays' claim that this was a better form of democracy. But in reality, the World's Fair had been an elaborate piece of propaganda designed by Bernays for his clients, the giant American corporations. Privately, Bernays did not believe that true democracy could ever work. He had been profoundly influenced in this by his uncle's theories of human nature. Freud believed that individuals were not driven by rational thought, but by primitive, unconscious desires and feelings. And Bernays believed that this meant it was too dangerous to let the masses ever have control over their own lives. And consumerism was a way of giving people the illusion of control, while allowing a responsible elite to continue managing society. It's not that the people are in charge, but that the people's desires are in charge. The people are not in charge. The people exercise no decision-making power within this environment. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to something which now increasingly is predicated on the idea of the public as passive consumers, the public as people who essentially what you're delivering them are doggy treats. The problem for New Labour was that it believed the propaganda. They took at face value the idea promoted by business that the systems invented to read the consumer's mind could form the basis for a new type of democracy. Once in power, New Labour tried to govern through a system that Philip Gould called continuous democracy. But what worked for business in designing products led the Labour government into a bewildering maze of contradictory whims and desires. For much of Labour's first term, the focus groups said that the railways were not a high priority, and Labour's policies faithfully reflected this. But now, 
those same groups are blaming the government for not having invested more money sooner in the railways. The point about focus group politics is that there isn't one because people are contradictory and irrational, and so you have a problem in terms of deciding what you're going to do if all you do is actually listen to a mass of individual opinions that are forever fluctuating and don't really have any coherence and crucially are not set in context. So that's why people can say, you know, um, I want lower taxes and better public services. Of course they do. You know, if you say, um, do you want to pay more taxes to get better public services, people are less sure. They then don't believe that if they do pay more taxes, they will be spent on better public services. So you end up in this quagmire where, you know, and the truth is, a politician has to say, look, this is what I believe. I believe that you should pay slightly more taxes to, to make better public services, and I pledge that I'm competent enough to actually use that money wisely. Do you want that vote for me, yes or no? And that's what Blair has failed to do. Tony Blair turns around and sort of tries to feed back to them what they already believe. And given what, the, what they believe is sort of a load of individual, um, in, incoherent, contradictory nonsense, that's all he has to offer. And then he wonders why people don't get him. You know, the answer they don't get him is because they're looking for someone to do something that they can't do themselves, which is actually come up with a coherent political opinion that they might have faith in. New Labour are faced with a dilemma. The system of consumer democracy that they have embraced has trapped them into a series of short-term and often contradictory policies. There are now growing demands that they fulfil a grand division, that they use the power of government to deal with the problems of growing inequality and the decaying social fabric of the country. But to do this, they will have to appeal to the electorate to think outside their own self-interest. And this would mean challenging the now dominant Freudian view of human beings as selfish, instinct-driven individuals, which is a concept of human beings that has been fostered and encouraged by business because it produces ideal consumers. Although we feel we are free, in reality, we, like the politicians, have become the slaves of our own desires. We have forgotten that we can be more than that that there are other sides to human nature. Fundamentally, here we have two different views of human nature and of democracy. You have the view that people are irrational, that they are bundles of unconscious emotion. Uh, that comes directly out of Freud. And businesses are very able to respond to that. That's what they have honed their skills doing. That's what marketing is really all about. What are the symbols, the music, the images, the words that will appeal to these unconscious feelings? Politics must be more than that. Politics and leadership are about engaging the public in a rational discussion and deliberation about what is best and treating people with respect in terms of their rational abilities to debate what is best. If it's not that, if it is Freudian, if it is basically a matter of appealing to the same basic unconscious feelings that business appeals to, then why not let business do it? Business can do it better. Business knows how to do it. Business, after all, is in the business of responding to those feelings. I see trees of green, red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world, I think to myself.